Hello, everyone, and welcome to the November edition of the ISJIP Live Journal Club. I'm your host and moderator, Deborah Smith, broadcasting live from Brisbane, Australia, together with my co-moderators, Dr. Rehan Lowry and Karen Talia. Our topic for this month is gynecologic cytopathology, and we have two trainees and an early career pathologist presenting today. I'd like to encourage those of you in the audience who are not ISJIP members to consider joining the society. Membership fees are discounted if you come from a developing country and membership is free for trainees. The Journal Club alternates between the USA and Australia month by month with a coordinator present in each hemisphere, which means two times of day uh, to choose from for those of you who want to present or join us live. As well as journal club, but trainees and junior pathologists can also participate in case-based presentations. The interesting case presentation sessions are moderated by Dr. Jennifer Bennett from the USA and Dr. Rabina Wadi from South Africa. Our objective for the journal club is to engage junior and trainee pathologists in critically evaluating the literature to improve presentation skills in a supportive environment. We offer feedback and mentor you as you develop and rehearse your presentation. As I just mentioned, two sites are open so you can choose which time of day would suit you best for presenting. We have PowerPoint templates to help guide you putting together your presentation. And this is a summary of the main steps that we follow when we're working through and assessing an article. Upcoming sessions for the ISJIP Live Educational Program are first in December the 1st, is just just around the corner, we have an update on endometriosis related neoplasia by Professor Glenn McGluggage from the UK. And then following that, on December the 8th, there's a slide session on a practical approach to cervical biopsies by Dr. Esther Alder. And in January, pattern based classification of endocervical adenocarcinoma by Dr. Kay Park. And a slide session on a practical approach to assessing myo invasion, LVSI, and nodal involvement by endometrial carcinoma by Dr. Amy Jolin Price. And I can personally say that I learned a lot from this education program and it's well worth um, signing up. You can actually register for this through the isgip.ca um, website listed at the top here, and they will send you out a link to join on the day. If you miss a session, you can also uh, get back in for the next couple of days. Or if you are a member, the material gets put up onto the educational website. The journal club sessions also get recorded and placed into uh, the YouTube. This is a webinar and so you can ask questions and answers if you're here with us live today. Please use the Q&A button to type questions for the presenters. And if you want to chat and tell us where you're from and offer some support, please use the chat function. And that sort of helps separate out the questions from other discussion in the background. So this month's theme is gynecological cytopathology. And we have Dr. Natawadi Laukarath from Thailand who's presenting a paper on HPV genotyping in uh, low-grade lesions and the risk for higher-grade lesions. We have Dr. Asher Go from Australia, who's uh, discussing a paper about point-of-care HPV DNA testing in Papua New Guinea with same-day treatment. And we have Dr. Rohini Joshi, also from Australia, presenting a paper on the cytomorphologic features of gastric-type endocervical adenocarcinoma. So these are our presenters. First, we have Dr. Natawadi Lokurath, uh, as I said, from Thailand, who is also a visiting fellow in Massachusetts General Hospital in the USA. We have Dr. Asher Go, who's a third year anatomical pathology registrar at the Royal Women's Hospital in Melbourne. And Dr. Rohini Joshi, who's a fourth year anatomical pathology registrar, again, at the Royal Women's Hospital in Melbourne. So first, we're going to have our first presenter, who is uh, Dr. Natawadi. Can you please um, turn on your camera, unmute, and we'll go from there. Hello. Can you sh Oh yeah. Yep, got it. Okay. Okay, thank you for the introduction and thank you for the opportunity to present and join the No Club. And today, the paper that I would like to talk about, um, sorry, is human papilloma virus genotype distribution in low-grade squamate in dry petiolation cytology and its immediate risk for high-grade cervical lesion or cancer, a center cross-sectional study 
and this paper was performed by gynecological oncologist team in Sidirat Hospital, Mahidol University, Thailand, and it was published in Obstetric and Gynecologic Science Journal this year. And firstly, I would like to give you the background of the paper. According to 2019 ACCP risk-based management guideline, the management was um, the man management for patients with abnormal cervical screening is based on the risk of syntripastillation on histology. And the syntripastillations include syntri squamous cell carcinoma, adenocarcinoma in situ, and adenocarcinoma. And then the personalized risk of syntripastillation is based on current and previous cytology and HPV testing results. And the guideline used clinical action thresholds to guide the management and also the follow-up duration with the principle of equal management for equal risk for sintry postulations, which means any patients who have the same risk of sintry postulations will receive the similar treatment. And the guideline used 4% as the clinical action threshold. The number of 4% is based on immediate syntrepus risk of HPV positive ASCOS or LCL. So any patient who have the immediate syntrepus risk greater than or equal to 4% need at least coposcopy. And with that said, coposcopy is recommended for ASCOS and LCL patients with HPV positive. But for the negative group, follow-up is recommended. However, in Thailand and other countries, the primary uh, method of screening uh, cervical cancer still based on cytology alone, which is less sensitive than HPV testing and also need a shorter interval for follow-up. The immediate management is also different as all else are referred to coposcopy, resulting in high coposcopic rate. For ASCUS patient, HPV testing can help reducing coposcopic rate by half because of by half of ASCUS show negative HPV. But for LCL, 80 to 85% show HPV positive, high risk, especially 16 and 18 genotypes. So HPV testing is not a good tool for triaging LCL patients. So the question is, if the prevalence of high-risk HPV in Thailand is lower than 85%, will HPV testing be beneficial for triaging LCL patients? And keep noticing that the number of 85% is based on American women. And with that question, they aimed to investigate the distribution of HPV genotypes in LCL cytology and the immediate risk for SIN2 and SIN2 postulations. For the methods, the study is prospective cross-sectional study. Participants were 21 years old or older with the cytologic diagnosis of LCL and underwent coposcopy between 2017 and 2019. Pregnant women and cervical cancer cases were excluded. And they did HPV typing in all patients to detect 14 high-risk HPV genotypes by PCR. Coposcopic directed biopsy was performed in all patients during coposcopy. If there was no lesions, random biopsy was done. And for endocervical curatage, it was optional. And uh, they did for the cases with inadequate transformation zone inadequate coposcopy or endocervical involvement. For the data collection, they collected age, menopausal status, HPV genotyping, coposcopic findings, coposcopic uh, cervical biopsy, histologic finding, and for simulation, it was reported by two-tier terminology as L-cell or H-cell. The data were analyzed by statistic tests and moving on to the results, the result showed 318 patients with the preference of high-risk HPV at 
which was lower than the previous reports. And HPV66 is the most common genotype in contrast to HPV16 and HPV18. The prevalence of high-risk HPV16 was 9.1% and HPV18 was 4.7%. For coposcopic finding, it showed normal by half and 6.6% show high grade lesion. And histologic finding showed that 6.1% uh, show no cell, 32.1% show L cell, 5.7% showed S cell, and interestingly, one case show adenocarcinoma in cervical biopsy. As this paper used SINTU as the endpoint, but in ASCCP guideline, it's used SIN3 as the endpoint. So the threshold for SIN2 postulation has not yet been defined. So this paper, they determined the cut point based on ASCCP guidelines recommendation. And it recommend that, uh, the, and it recommend immediate coposcopy in cases above the threshold for HPV positive ASCOS or LCL regardless of HPV status. So in this paper, they used 6% as the clinical action threshold for coposcopy. And with this cutoff, cut um, only the group of HPV positive should undergo coposcopy. And it can decrease coposcopic rate by 40.9%. And this table show clinical characteristics compared between low-grade lesion and high-grade lesion on histology. And they found that coposcopic finding alone or combined with HPV status showed a significant prediction of high-grade lesion on histology. Moving on to the discussion, the results showed that the prevalence of high-risk HPV was 60% which was lower than the previous reports. And the prevalence of high-risk HPV varies among the countries and also the different regions of Thailand. HPV-66 was the most common type, which was different from the predominant genotype in other countries. So they pointed out the ethnic and geographic um, variations of genotypes and prevalence of HPV high risk. They also pointed that HPV testing might be, been, uh, might be useful for triaging patients with l cytology. And this finding is inconsistent with AHCCP guideline, saying that HPV triaging is not recommended for l cytology. This finding could be explained by the lower prevalence of high-risk HPV 16 and 18 genotype in Thailand. So it is construed that HPV triaging might be beneficial for L-cell cytology in areas those have um, lower prevalence of high-risk HPV 16 and 18 genotype. But before we can conclude that, we should consider multiple factors, those I listed here, which are genotype distribution, clinical significance of preferent genotypes, local infrastructure, taste availability, and cost effectiveness. For the limitations, firstly, the follow-up duration in this paper, paper is relatively short with less than two years follow-up. And they didn't show the follow-up data on cytology or subsequent histology. In addition, they use SIN2 as the endpoint for precancer, but SIN2 is less reproducible, less prognostic, and might resolve spontaneously. So SIN2 might not represent precancer in some cases. For applications, I think this paper is a good start for uh, a further research with a larger number of sample size and uh, longer, uh, longer follow-up duration to reach the local guideline or population-based specific guideline. And also the information about genotype distribution could be used 
for vaccine development and vaccine advice. For pathologists, it is strongly recommended in ASCP guidelines to qualify a histologic assay by SYN2 or SYN3 because both SYN2 and SYN3 have different disease progression and treatment options, especially for the younger patients. On top of that, I'm personally intrigued by some findings in this paper as by half of uh, l cytology showed normal corposcopic finding and two thirds of them show uh, no cell histology. Also one case show adenocarcinoma in cervical biopsy. Uh, this might be an interesting point for further study focusing on corposcopic cyto and histocorrelation in the future. And that's all I have. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Natawadi. That was an excellent presentation. And um, we're just going to go straight through now to the presentation from Asha, and we'll uh, collect our questions at the end. Hmm? Okay. So Asha, can you share your screen and unmute as well? Thank you. All right. Um, great. Hopefully everyone's seeing the main presentation screen rather than presenter mode. Um, yeah, we are. My name is Asha. I'm a third year anatomical pathology registrar currently placed at the Royal Women's Hospital in Melbourne. Um, and thank you for having me today uh, to present uh, at this gynecology pathology journal club. So, um, the general article that I'll be covering today is um, the point of care HPV DNA testing of self-collected specimens um, and same day thermal ablation for the early detection and treatment of cervical precancer in Papua New Guinea. So this is a prospective single um, intervention trial. Um, and from the title, we can probably see that there are two components to this study. That is the self-collection of HPV DNA testing and treatment. The aim of this study is to evaluate the clinical performance of the HPV self-test, um, along with the strategy of same-day treatment with ablation. So this outcome is measured with the calculation of um, sensitivity, specificity, positive predictive value, and the negative predictive value. Um, the other aspect that this study aims to evaluate too is um, patient's reception to its test and treatment. Um, in other words, the ease of use and acceptability within patients. And an important part too is because the strategy is going to be implemented um, or the evaluation is to be implemented um, in low to middle income countries, that the uh, one aspect is that um, it should be practical um, and cost effective, um, re relevant to its uh, requirements of health system and the workforce. Um, and also acceptable within the community and the clinicians. So this study aims to evaluate new recommendations that's been set up by the WHO. Um, that is that the, there is a new method of primary screening with the detection of HPV DNA. Um, and this is a change from the previous visual inspection method of applying acetic acid um, or Lugol's iodine. Um, and as visual inspection methods have, um, oh, sorry, give me a second. That's just kind of popped up. Um, as visual inspection methods have been shown to have poor performance for the detection of cervical precancer. Um, the management strategy has also been updated with thermal ablation um, being the current recommended treatment instead of cryotherapy. And this is because thermal ablation offers higher treatment rates, more favorable profile of adverse events, and fewer log log logistical requirements. So the individual components of this new recommendations have been previously evaluated, um, and modeling has shown that this new screen and treat algorithms are effective. However, there is still a lack of real-world study evaluating this stra new strategy as a whole. So, this study was conducted in Papua New Guinea across two different sites with women um, aged between 30 and 59 years old. And it was run as a single arm intervention trial um, as a randomized study design was not ethically feasible. 
Um, this is especially since after earlier research has shown that screening based on visual inspection methods um, have a poor performance. So the women were educated on self-collection through um, pictorials um, and group discussions, um, tested for the, um, collected their own tests and the results were given to them on the same day. Uh, those testing positive um, for HPV were then offered public examination to assess the uh, um, eligibility for thermal ablation. Um, and those with, who were eligible for thermal ablation had their transformation zone visible in its entirety. And if it wasn't visible or in its entirety, or if there were other abnormalities such as a cervical polyp, uh, suspicion for cervical cancer, um, patients were then referred on to the gynecologist. Uh, the women who underwent a pelvic examination had a clinician collected um, liquid based cytology sample um, as a reference standard for evaluating the primary outcome. And the statistical method or analysis um, is that from previous studies, about 14 or 18 percent of women were test positive for HPV. And as such, in the study, an estimated they used the number of 15 percent um, to and which were randomly selected. Um, to provide an equivalent number of specimens as HPV-positive women. Uh, these samples were then sent across um, to VCS pathology in Melbourne um, and assessed by two different teams blinded to the HPV test results. So all the patients who had a public examination would then follow up at 3 and 12 months and um, secondary outcomes were measured using a combination of quantitative and qualitative methods um, and acceptability was assessed with a short semi-structured questionnaire. So this flow chart provides an overview of the participant flow. So a total of 4,285 patients were enrolled. Um, and following the chart to the right, 647 patients tested positive for HPV. Uh, most notable is that the majority of women testing positive for HPV received um, treatment or review by a um, gynecologist. Um, and as such, 93% uh, um, received same day thermal ablation. Uh, 42, uh, uh, sorry, 42 of them, which was 6.5%, um, were referred on to gynecology review um, for cervical lesion or suspected invasive disease. And on the HPV negative side, 15% uh, um, were randomly selected to provide the um, liquid based cytology specimen as reference standard. So a total um, of 1,182 liquid based cytology specimens were collected. Um, however, some of them were unsatisfactory and as such, 1,008 specimens were examined per protocol. Um, and out of 545 HPV positive women, 192 were found to have um, HCL or worse. So this allows us to calculate the positive predictive value. Um, it's, all of them were treated with thermal ablation um, or at least referred on to gynecology review. And of all the women referred, um, um, they were found to have HCL or SCC. So the estimated performance was calculated after fitting in estimates of hybrid disease um, within to the entire cohort of 4,285 women. So this allowed us to, of the authors, to calculate the sensitivity, which was 85.4%, the specificity um, at 89.6%, the positive predictive value um, of 35.2%, and uh, negative predictive value of 98.9%. Um, and another thing to note is that um, given that no test is perfect, some of the cases um, of HCL or worse were missed um, for the people who tested negative for HPV. Um, and further breaking it down, um, of these five um, patients with HCL or worse, um, three of them had HCL and two of them had adenocarcinoma. Um, the authors considered that the adenocarcinomas were HPV negative and possibly a reason why my heart. Um, have written a positive test. So just moving on to the secondary outcomes. Um, the study has um, 
from the questionnaires, the authors found that the patients, a majority of them have reported um, finding the service very satisfactory. Uh, the collection was very easy, uh, easy or very easy, and that um, the duration of the visit was satisfactory or quicker than expected. So moving on to discussion, um, it's interesting to sort of have a study that pretty much encompasses the test and treat um, strategy um, and using liquid-based cytology um, as a reference standard. Um, the, from this study, the clinical performance is consistent with their previous pilot study um, in Papua New Guinea uh, and other studies evaluating the individual components too, such as the self-testing, the you know, efficacy of self-testing. Um, alongside this, the positive predictive value in Papua New Guinea is also consistent with their previous study. Um, importantly, too, um, the study has shown high treatment rates with the majority of patients receiving ablation or gynecology re um, referral, um, and 93% of them receiving the same day ablation. Uh, among the 329 HPV positive women who attended a clinical follow up at three months, um, um, a small proportion of them, 15%, reported that they had uh, experienced adverse events, um, but all of them were mild and resolved by the time at, um, of the follow up in three months. Um, the authors have noted that there weren't any serious adverse events um, in this study. Uh, so, this will probably um, lead to a high acceptability of the service um, and possibly higher treatment rates within the community. So just for comparison, um, in terms of self-collecting uh, collection HPV testing, um, Australia has expanded this um, and is no longer restricted to under or never screened populations. Um, this is especially after studies have shown that detection of HPV positivity was comparable to clinician collected samples, um, along with the added benefit of being highly acceptable. Um, it's worth kind of considering whether the same day treatment strategy is applicable to Australia, um, perhaps less so um, due to better overall access um, in Australia um, and follow up treatment. Um, whereas in areas with higher barriers to access um, or less clinician available or medical workforce, um, the same day treatment strategy is worth consideration. So this study's, uh, study has raised um, several limitations of probably areas of concern, um, mainly that given that the, even in Papua New Guinea with a very high disease bur burden of HPV, um, positive predictive value was 35%, um, but there is still a concern that there might be some overtreatment. Um, and given, however, given that HPV is a predictor of both current and future disease, the authors have anticipated that PPV um, will increase during ongoing follow-up of HPV uh, positive women. Um, however, perhaps in other countries where the positive predictive value is a bit lower, um, whether the same strategy of same day treatment is still visible, uh, feasible, um, and something to sort of um, continually evaluate, I believe. Um, additionally, because um, they, the authors have used the calculation of estimated performance, um, there is a potential for under or overestimation um, of the clinical performance. Um, authors have also noted that there was suboptimal retention at three, the follow up in three months. So, approximately only about 55 patients um, returned for follow up at three months. Um, although this will probably emphasize the importance of same day treatment strategy if patients tested positive and have required treatment. Um, if they weren't going to come in, that's possibly um, sort of like a um, uh, disadvantage to that. Um, because secondary, the secondary outcomes were quite subjective. Um, even in this study, it showed that it was highly acceptable. Um, in different settings and different communities, it might vary and something that should be um, continually assessed. Uh, lastly, uh, because liquid-based cytology was used as a reference standard in this study, um, although histology is used as the gold standard, um, the authors have decided to go with LBC mainly due to the ethical issues. 
such that you can't biopsy HPV negative women for comparison. Um, and the other aspect too is that um, there are a few sort of diagnoses such as H cell adenocarcinoma, where in, especially in the HPV negative groups, which might have a um, lower level of disease, but this can be known for certain. So that's possibly a um, limitation to it. Um, with regards to moving on from this study, in terms of future studies, I, um, ultimately the true impact of um, this strategy um, will be best evaluated through the overall reduction in cervical cancer. Um, and the other thing to note is that the authors have also um, not covered in this uh, article um, is the cost and requirements for implementation. So that would be something to be um, to read up on, which will be quite interesting. Next. Lower ground medical Sorry. imaging CT. Um, so, in conclusion, this study has shown that the implementation of a test and same day treatment strategy is feasible um, and could potentially be integrated or applied through scaling up the program um, within Papua New Guinea um, and expanding to other countries within the region with similar disease burden. Um, this study has also reinforced the performance of. Um, self-collected versus clinician-collected HPV test, um, being similar with a, um, um, being quite similar to, um, with each other, um, and may lead to increased adoption of self-collected tests. Um, so this strategy um, potentially could be uh, implemented in um, places like Australia, developed nations like Australia, perhaps in areas where the population is a bit more at risk um, with high disease burden or poor follow-up, um, something that um, maybe um, we should look, look, be able to look at. So this concludes my talk. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, I've also attached a few um, sort of references here, just with regards to the WHO guidelines for screening and treatment of cervical precancer, along with the thermal ablation that they have um, recommended over cryotherapy. Thank you very much. Um, welcome, any questions? Or oh, perhaps that's at the end. Yeah, thanks very much, Asha. That's fantastic. Um, and now we are going to move straight through to our next mm -hmm. presenter, Rohini, and we'll do questions at the end. So if you can, yeah, thank you. So Rohini, can you please um, unmute and share your screen? Mm -hmm. OK. Um, so hi everyone, my name's Rohini and I'm a fourth year trainee at the Royal Women's Hospital in Melbourne, Australia. Um, today I'll be discussing this paper from North America, which was published in Acta Cytologica last year, looking at the features of gastric type endocervical adenocarcinoma on liquid-based cytology. So um, gastric type adenocarcinoma is an HPV-independent cancer of the endocervix, which I'll refer to as GAS going forward. Um, it includes diagnoses previously called minimal deviation adenocarcinoma and adenoma malignum, which were named for their deceptively bland histological appearance in contrast to their aggressive behaviour clinically. Um, the cytological features of GAS and its precursors are not well defined, thus clinically significant abnormalities are often overlooked or misinterpreted on pap tests where they can mimic benign or reactive endocervical cells. And this ultimately leads to downstream effects um, such as delayed management, which is likely further affected by the introduction of HPV testing as the primary means of screening. So um, histopathological diagnosis of GAS can be subtle, um, haphazardly arranged, deeply invasive, but well-formed glands um, composed of cells with variable atypia and a gastric phenotype seen as abundant pale cytoplasm and distinct cell borders. These tumors are generally negative, negative for ER, PR, and HPV testing. Um, so the study acknowledges um, that the gastric type endocervical adenocarcinoma is a morphologically elusive entity in need of objective criteria that can help increase rates of early detection. Um, it's therefore aimed at observing the cytological features of GAS on PAP tests from North America with a focus on liquid-based cytology preparations, 
And the study hypothesizes that uniform nuclear enlargement may be a reproducible characteristic um, that leads to cytological classification as at least atypical glandular cells, which then warrants specialist referral and appropriate follow up. So uh, with the methods, 17 pap test slides from 14 patients diagnosed with GAS on histology were retrieved between an 18 and a half year period um, with the controls being pap test slides of 12 usual type endosylvacal adenocarcinoma cases and 12 cases which were negative for intraepithelial lesion or malignancy, which I'll refer to simply as negative going forward. Um, the slides were uh, with abnormalities were examined for 15 pre-determined predeterm morphological variables and all cases had um, morphometric analysis of the larger surface area of 15 glandular cells on those slides in relation to three to five neutrophils on the same slide to generate these normalized gland glandular cell nuclear to neutrophil area ratios. So start with some demographics uh, and time intervals. The, the median patient age at the time of histological diagnosis of GAS was 59.5 years, and the median interval between sign out of the most recent PAP test and validation of the histological diagnosis was 75 days. Um, and 11 of the 14 patients uh, who were ultimately diagnosed with GAS suggest uh, they had GAS suggested or diagnosed in the original histopathological report. Um, with three cases dating prior to 2010 that were diagnosed on review. Uh, P16 immunohistochemistry showed focal or patchy reactivity in three of the tumours, and HPV was undetectable in all of the tested tumours, which included the P16 reactive ones. So this table shows the retrospective review of the cytological cases associated with the patient subsequently diagnosed with GAS on histology. Um, as you can see here, eight of the 16 cases were diagnosed as adenocarcinoma. Um, and of note, the cases highlighted in yellow are the cases that were upgraded to adenocarcinoma from an original AIS or atypical glandular cell diagnosis. But the cases in red that I've highlighted um, are six out of the seven cases that were originally reported as negative, which were found to be reportable as atypical glandular cells or higher. So, um, and also one negative case was confirmed. Uh, there was one direct smear case that was excluded from further analysis, and that was to focus on the liquid-based cytology findings. So the 15 remaining um, LBC PAP tests from GAS patients with identical glandular uh, abnormalities were then examined for the following features. Um, and the most discriminatory features in GAS cases were um, architecturally that they that 87% formed honeycomb-like sheets um, compared with only 8.3% in the usual type um, adenocarcinoma controls. 93% um, showed prominent nucleoli as opposed to 25%. And all 15 um, or 100% of the GAS cases had foamy microvesicular cytoplasm compared to 17% in the control. Here you can see the honeycomb-like sheets somewhat resembling the drunken honeycomb appearance um, of pancreatic or biliary carcinomas that we might be more familiar with um, on, on the top here um, and microvesicular cytoplasm below on thin prep and uh, shore path respectively. There were some common features that were present across both types of adenocarcinoma um, uh, at high rates, such as nuclear enlargement and round to ovoid nuclei, but there were some features, although uncommon, that were unique to GAS, namely um, the presence of yellow mucin, um, intracellular, uh, sorry, intranuclear pseudoinclusions, and the presence of goblet or panathlax cells seen here. Um, these features were all seen in 20% of the GAS LBCs and in none of the usual type controls. And this bottom right image here shows an example of neutrophil entrapments in 33% of both types of adenocarcinoma, which I'll address in more detail later. Moving on to the cytomorphometric nuclear area analysis aspect of the study, um, it, it's well established, and I've already mentioned that GAS can mimic the architecture and mucin content of benign or reactive endocervical epithelium, um, which is seen here. Um, which is also then distinct from usual type adenocarcinoma as seen in this figure. The study objectively measured the largest surface area of glandular cell nuclei in GAS, usual type and negative cases, and compared them to the area of the neutrophils on the same slide um, to generate the aforementioned ratios in order to take variability of cytological preparations into account between the slides. 
um, the findings seen on this graph uh, that the benign nuclei had um, a surface area similar to that of a neutrophil with a mean ratio of 0.99. The UEA cases had a mean ratio of 1.56 and GAS cases had nuclei which were just over twice the size um, of a neutrophil or benign in the cervical cell. Now for the discussion. Um, so background mucin is, just, is historically a feature that would be associated with the diagnosis of gastric type lesions, particularly in the days of direct smear cytology. But extracellular mucin has been found to be less detectable in LBC preparations, likely due to the same process that reduces the amount of necrotic debris. Um, so Kawakami et al. did a study published in 2015 that heavily influences and serves kind of as a foundation for this paper. And they reported prominent background using in all of their GAS cases, but also in just over half of their UEA cases. Um, the diagnostic usefulness of this finding is therefore probably a little bit doubtful. Um, so a literature review of five studies on the presence of yellow intracytoplasmic mucin found mostly um, low sensitivity for GAS and that it's often present in many benign gastric or pyloric type glandular proliferations. Also, um, Omori et al. stated that um, the yellow mucin becomes paler on LBC and therefore may be less recognizable. Thus, it was concluded that yellow mucin is likely a feature of well-differentiated, benign, or pre-malignant lesions of gastric type, and this feature alone should probably not be exclusively relied upon for the cytological detection of GAS. An example of this, here we see abundant yellow intracytoplasmic mucin in a thin prep slide of a Brunner gland hamartoma of the duodenum, which is a benign proliferation and reassuringly shows cytological features of terminal differentiation by the presence of a brush border indicated by this arrowhead and one of the many goblet cells indicated by the arrow. And um, so with regards to one of the contrasting findings of this study, intracytoplasmic neutrophil entrapment was only identified in 35% of GAS cases in this paper, compared to 93% of cases in Kawakami et al. study. A potential explanation um, was thought to be the inclusion of endometrial cytology samples. And it's important to note um, that this feature was also seen in 70% of usual type adenocarcinomas in that study. So the usefulness of this feature and the distinction between GAS and UEA is thought to be low. Uh, and I'm sure when we all saw the image of the entrapped neutrophils that I showed before, we had another diagnosis come to mind, the, the bag of poly's appearance is almost pathognomonic for endometrial adenocarcinoma, which would be an additional differential if this feature were to be present. Um, so the strengths of this study were that it confirmed some known differentiating and common features between GAS and UEA previously studied, and it provides well thought out explanations for the findings that are a bit at odds with the previous literature. The comparison of nuclear areas are novel and widely, like relatively widely applicable feature to aid in the cytological diagnosis of otherwise difficult to recognize glandular lesions such as GAS. Um, some areas for potential improvement were the fact that the final diagnosis of GAS histologically was not blinded at the time of retrospective cytology review, which could have introduced confirmation bias. Um, and also with a move towards HPV testing without reflex cytology, we're probably likely to see less PAP tests of early presentation or precursor lesions of GAS due to the HPV independent nature of the tumor and classical symptoms kind of needing to be present um, to trigger a pap test clinically. Uh, and finally, with only 16 cases retrieved in an 18 and a half year, in like the 18 and a half years encompassing this retrospective study, the small sample size potentially undermines the validity and the st st statistical significance of the findings, not necessarily the, the clinical significance. Um, so regarding applicability, the architecture and cytoplasmic features appear significant in the distinction between GAS and usual type adenocarcinoma cytologically, um, and the nuclear enlargement in comparison to neutrophils or benign endocervical cell nuclei is subjectively applicable, the way that we compare nuclei for squamous lesions, for example, to immature squamous cell nuclei. Um, unfortunately, as it stands, GAS is a rare entity representing 10 to 50 percent of all cervical adenocarcinomas worldwide with higher rates in Japan. So the overall impact and applicability will likely suffer as a result. 
Um, the decision, uh, sorry, the discussion uh, mentions a 2020 study uh, study on the transcriptome profile of endocervical adenocarcinoma, which points towards tight junction disruption as a potential molecular mechanism for metastasis in intestinal and gastric type adenocarcinomas. Thus, the exploration of a molecular pathway and subsequent development of a more effective means of detection may be of higher yield, like the progress and changes that, that have been made uh, with the HPV-driven tumors, uh, tumor types in recent years. Um, and in summary, GAS is a clinically aggressive tumor with relatively low rates of cytological detection um, antecedently. Um, yellow mucin, intracellular pseudo-inclusions, and the presence of goblet or panoth-like cells may permit a presumptive diagnosis of GAS in the appropriate clinical radiological context, possibly supported by prominent nucleoli and the lack of feathering, which would be more usual type features. Um, but this would obviously be in addition to other more common findings of nuclear enlargement, uh, hopefully maybe some honeycomb-like sheet architecture and prominent nucleoli, as well as that microvesicular foamy cytoplasm. And finally, I think uh, further studies on the molecular underpinnings will likely help improve detection and prognosis of these tumours, more so than refining the cytologic diagnostic criteria of these tumours. Um, and that's it for me. I'll stop sharing my screen. Thank you very much, Rohini. Again, another excellent presentation and a fantastic ending there. Um, I'm going to hand it over. Karen, can you put up? Okay. <laughs> um, I think a good starting point is to um, ask each of our presenters what they they got out of these papers. What do you think is the main learning point here? Um, and if you want to kick us off, um, Natawadi, that would be a good place to start, I think. For me, I think uh, as this paper is more clinical thing, uh, so key takeaway for me is uh, after this, I will try to qualify the um, high cell cytology or histology to SYN2 and SYN3 because that have the different disease progression and treatment options that I have said. And in this paper, I think um, uh, we need uh, we need a lot more data on this before we can implement the HPV testing in uh, in the real uh, screening method in Thailand. But if we can implement that, I think it helps a lot because um, the cost of corposcopy combined with pathology examination is twice of HPV testing. If we can cut cost of that, we can save a lot. So, so if I understand correctly from what you said, um, you, you obviously don't have a routine HPV testing as your primary screening modality. You do cytology. Is it liquid-based or is it conventional? Um, we use liquid-based liquid 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 -based based. cytology, yeah. And then from what you said, every patient with an L-cell plus goes to colposcopy? Yes, yes, all of them, yeah. So if we sent every patient who had an L-cell on cytology, Colposcopy, people would be waiting three years to get a colp because it's you know it it must reflect the lower rate of screening in your country. The fact that your colposcopy clinics can cope with that volume. Yeah, yes, that's why I think uh, that's why they came up with this idea of research to reduce the number of colposcopy. Yeah. Yeah. Absolutely. Can I ask a question? Sorry, can I jump in and ask a question there about Please. Thailand? So is that is that screening approach, is that across all of Thailand or is was that specific to the hospital and the area that this was run in? It's quite homogeneous in Thailand as the HPV testing is not is not quite um, implemented in in screening methods yet. I mean mainly it's based on cytology alone. Um, we've got an audience question, if you'd like me to pose that now. Thank you, Naveen. Um, and this is uh, for you, Natawadi. Um, given the high proportion of cases with negative findings, was the cytology reviewed? Um, at this point, uh, to be honest, I don't know about that, what that was uh, reviewed or not. 
Um, I can jump in and say this is actually something Natawadi and I discussed a little bit when we were talking about this paper, about the high rate of LCIL, which ended up having no colposcopic or biopsy abnormality, and which we found interesting and the paper doesn't dissect. And it doesn't say anywhere that they specifically went back and reviewed those cases. Yeah, which, which is part of the argument for not using LCIL as a triage mechanism uh, l cell on cytology is a triage mechan mechanism for colposcopy because it is, a, it is a, I don't want to say it's a non-specific finding, but there are other processes in the mix that can produce similar um, changes to HPV and non-specific minor squamous reactive changes. Things like perimenopausal changes, age-related changes, inflammatory processes, um, infectious processes. Mm -hmm. I actually feel the same way about histology often, where you get very minor changes getting pushed through it as also, and the woman carries it with her for until they end up getting culp here anyway. Um, yeah, but yeah. Or getting, end up getting a let's because they can't find it. But sometimes I think we call it also because we're afraid to miss something. So I think also there's an Australian bias where every every cervical biopsy we see in Australia, you will know the HPV status up front. And so mm -hmm. therefore, I think you always go into these mm -hmm. with a bias compared to the olden days of conventional smears where HPV status is not known. I don't know if Karen would agree with that, but I, I think sometimes it I, does, it, it does influence your judgment a little bit in borderline cases. Totally agree. Um, having practiced um, in cervical um, cytology pre-renewal, so pre-HPV becoming our screening tool, we were we needed to be completely convinced that there were changes of HPV effect before we would make that diagnosis histologically and, and cytologically. Um, now, knowing that a patient is HPV positive, I think our thresholds have all lowered. Um, and I will call things HPV on histology with uh, without the florid HPV changes that we were taught were classic. With, and I guess I've um, come to appreciate that there are more subtle manifestations histologically. So I'm definitely calling more things HPV, um, knowing that the patient's already been told she has HPV. I feel um, emboldened to make that diagnosis more readily on histology. So it definitely influences us. Hmm. I suppose a question for Natawadi, and this may be a difficult question for you to answer because it's a little more, little bit more clinical. Countries mm -hmm. obviously have guidelines about treatment pathways. Um, and as you said, high-risk HPV testing is not part of the standard um, diagnostic pathway in Thailand. But everywhere you have guidelines, people divert from them and will do different things. Do you think that, you know, in Thailand, do you think that maybe in the private sector that people do get HPV testing before colposcopy? Is there perhaps more, um, more difference in practice than necessarily sticking to the strict screening program? Yeah, yeah, I think about that too, that in some parts of Thailand or other institutes or maybe private hospitals, they will do that. Yeah, They will follow the full guideline because uh, patients might can't afford that. And now a question for you, Asha, from about your paper as well. Look, um, one of the things I've, it was very interesting because it's such a, a different environment to what we work in, in terms of uh, people getting repetitive testing before they get treated. So I, I did find that very interesting. Um, one of the things I noticed was that the, one of the reasons for treating upfront is the very poor return rate, the poor follow-up rate. But one of the things I did notice is the woman who they counseled to go and see the gynecologists had a much um, higher rate of follow-up attendance um, in your flowchart coming through there as compared to the woman who had um, been told to come back as follow-up for their HPV test or just a repeat test in the future. Have you got any thoughts about that or? Um, um, yeah. No, I was I was thinking about that, and I do wonder whether, because the ones where they have referred on to see a gynecologist often have a, I guess, more advanced disease, like, you know, something that's more visible. Um, they possibly might have more, um, I suppose, symptoms. Um, and the other, possibly also another thing, too, is that um, having someone talk to them and educate them might have probably, you know, made them more aware of um, 
I suppose, the importance of following up um, as opposed to here's your test, come back and um, your test is, you know, just come back and see us in three months. So having that perhaps better education might have been, you know, increase the follow-up rate too. Um, yeah. Follow-up rate too. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, I agree, because I think you've brought out yeah, some really good areas to really follow up research in the future. I've got a bad echo. Is anybody else getting that? Sorry. Okay. Yeah. Um, and finally, <laughs> Rohini as well, looking at your paper, that was, look, I'm always very nervous about missing uh, endocervical uh, carcinomas of the cervix. Uh, we don't do cytology here, and it's one of the reasons I'm glad I don't. Um, I, I had was originally looking at this thinking, you know, can we see these going forwards as opposed to retrospectively? But I realized as you presented that actually these had been picked mostly up front. Um, and I guess that then led me to think about is this a reflection of specialist practice versus general practice? Um, do you know from the paper whether this was a, a cyto specialty area? Because I know that I've worked in areas where we've done gynae cytology at a you know, quite small practices in the past. And although in Australia, we're limited by numbers, obviously worldwide, this is not the case. Yeah, so the paper did, I mean, the people that reviewed, did the review cytology for this study were like gynecological cytopathologists and pathologists. But um, yeah, and it was, so the, the majority of the cases that were retrieved for this study were from the, um, the institution um, that, you know, ultimately diagnosed everything. Um, so I think uh, they didn't specify, um, but uh, I think it was definitely a, an institution that did deal with um, gynae cytology and histology and had specialists, at least two specialists and a fellow um, that reported these cases. Do you think this is something that we can do in the real world if we, you know, in a general setting? Um, I think I think it's difficult. Um, Looking at just the images that we had on the paper, I think it's really hard to be able to tell that like sometimes in, the, in, in those cases where maybe you don't have the microvesicular cytoplasm, just going by prominent nucleoli and slightly bigger nuclei to tell between reactive endocervical cells, especially when you have those like honeycomb sheets, which, you know, if you use Occam's razor, you think the more common thing would be reactive endocervical cells because I mean it's such a rare you know entity this gastric type endo uh, adenocarcinoma the endocervix so I think yeah knowing that it's rare might kind of impact the diagnosis of it um, clinicians knowing or thinking that it's difficult to diagnose cytologically might affect it too and also I don't know what it's like elsewhere but in Victoria there's one institution that looks at all gynae cyto um, and Karen works there <laughs> at VCS I'm pretty sure that's the only one in Victoria that looks at it so I think people that don't see it especially would have trouble but, but the point is that, that that VCS does see all of it um, so yeah I think I think uh, Ultimately, using cytology as a screening method is probably not going to be the best thing going forward. I think the most awesome thing would be is if we develop something like, you know, molecular like we do with HPV testing, but as a, you know, for the glandular lesions that we could just, you know, take a swab of, you know, the endocervix or a high vaginal swab or whatever and send it off to a lab and it tells us that there's, you know, this, this STK11 mutation or whatever it is that and I think that's where the further research is. Uh, one of the things that I did learn or like got out of this journal club is that I really feel 30 because things that I find exciting now are definitely not things I find found exciting 10 years ago. And just like the prospect of like, you know, streams of research that could flow on from this type of stuff is just really exciting. Um, yeah. So Rohini, a, a bit of a question. Uh, mm. I think all of the cases that you had in, they used in your paper, they were carcinomas and they went back retrospectively. So this is a, so if you like your paper is about the features of malignancy. I mean, I suppose my question would be, so you've already said, gee, this is hard finding the outright cancers. What do you think about the precursor lesions? How are you going to fight? How, how would you find them? And what do you think are the implications of trying to screen for something, which, which as you said, is really uncommon? Yeah, it's really rare. And um, 
uh, Karen and I were talking about like the, you know, the symptoms that would kind of lead to investigations ultimately, which, you know, like you don't get, if you're HPV negative, you're not going to get a cytology smear in Australia anyway, basically, I think ultimately, I mean, there's obviously exclusion um, or like exceptions. Um, you'd need to have a combination of being the right age. Uh, if you have like Puteaga syndrome, that makes you more likely to have this type, this type, this specific type. Um, so you'd be at a higher you know, rate of being screened for it as opposed to the general non-Puteaga syndrome population, but watery discharge. And then, you know, if, if you know, cytology isn't definitive, I should hope that, I mean, they'd also have ultrasound where you see a multi-cystic appearance of the cervix um, and plus or minus cervical MRI. So yeah, I, uh, sorry, I'm kind of forgetting the question a little bit, but <laughs> um, yeah, I think, I think in terms of like, yeah, investigating, it's kind of triggered by symptoms in patients that are clinically low risk. Um, so I don't know, I think it, it would, I think that's, that's part of the reason why these get caught so late, aside from people being, you know, potentially being stoic at the age of 59.5 as well. And, and I suppose, that, and you mentioned at-risk populations, including the Pertiegas population. Now, I don't work somewhere where we don't have a big Pertiegas cohort, but having seen this and knowing what you know, and this is hopefully also, it'd be an interesting question to ask Karen, what, what do you tell ladies with Pertiegas syndrome about cervical screening? Yeah, uh, I, I wouldn't know. I mean, I think they, they if they, uh, with regards to cervical screening, did you say, Rowan? Yeah, I mean, you've got a, a population that's more at risk for this for this very hard to detect lesion. I mean, is there a recommendation for these for patients yeah. in this situation, or um, possibly? This is part of the reason why I'm not in clinical medicine anymore, Rowan. <laughs> <laughs> no, no, no. Um, yeah, I think I think they'd be they'd, it would be in, like the the genetic counselling would involve going through things like that, especially in the women or like the mm. cervix. Um, the, the, the populations that had services that have also got Puteaga syndrome, I guess. I just lost the audio for a big chunk of time there, but was the question about whether there's organised screening for Puteaga patients? Because there yeah, are well, recommendations. Yeah. Of that. Hmm. Yeah, yeah, that, that was, these women yeah, that was have basically annual, it. Yeah. yeah, annual, I think the recommendations that have been published are annual uh, vaginal ultrasound and cervical cytology. But... I don't know how routinely that is um, put in practice. And I certainly don't see LBCs coming through with the clinical notes, Portiago screening. Uh, mm. So yeah, I don't know that it's a routine, routinely adopted process. Mm. Did you do you see many prophylactic procedures for Pertiagas patients? Because we we don't norm, we don't have a cohort of them here. So I was wondering, you know, how many? I mean, I imagine if I was a forty-year-old woman, I'd be pretty sick of cervical screening so yeah, I'd totally. to, yeah. no I, I um we I've had a I've seen come through our department a gastric type adenocarcinoma in a Poitsiaga patient um but not a prophylactic history of me yeah. mm. which is odd because um I agree I think I think I'd be um to relinquish <laughs> uh, my cervix if uh if I had Poitsiaga We're over the hour, Deb. Should we, we are, wind okay. up? Yes. <laughs> we should. Thank you very much, guys. Rohini, Asha, and Atawadi, they were excellent presentations. I really enjoyed them. And, um, yeah, thank you for your contribution to our discussion. And thanks for all the attendees as well for coming in and joining us um, and providing questions as well. Thank you, Davina. <laughs> See you later. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Bye.